All right. I think we're going to get started, if y'all are ready. Because you know I like to start things on time whenever I have the power to. So. <laughs> All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for coming. As you all know, I am Mayor Emma Mulvaney-Stanick, and we're doing a final press conference on the fiscal year 25 budget, which tonight the City Council will take action on. And this really culminates many, many weeks of hard, hard work and many, many hours of hard work as well. So I want to just open with saying I am proud of this budget. I'm proud because it is a budget that begins an important multi-year process of right-sizing our city government so we can sustain city services in an affordable and strategic way. It raises revenue in ways of, that keep affordability in mind. It is balanced. This budget had a $14.2 million gap in the end, and I am particularly proud of working with my department heads and city councilors to close this gap and increase investments in our community safety all at the same time within these first three months of my administration. This is a community safety budget. It is focused because it includes $2.47 million more in operating investments in our police department, $1.4 million more in operating investments in our fire department. It fully funds another year of our community response team through our fire department. It includes an additional $150,000 for safety and security at our library, which includes a social worker. It includes $50,000 for basic supports for unhoused people currently trying to live on our public lands. It also fully funds 11 community safety officers we know as CSOs. It fully funds and staffs our firefighters at their full numbers. And it funds an additional 10 positions for officers, sworn officers, as we continue to rebuild our police department to the full cap of 87 officers. This budget will also include, uh, it also includes beginning, the beginnings of important sustainable budget principles, including reducing reliance on one-time funds, right-sizing the size of our government by reducing the growth rate of our general fund expenditures. For reference, we had a 7% growth rate in fiscal year 23, a 9% growth, growth rate for this current fiscal year of 24. We're going back down to a 7% growth rate in fiscal year 25. And to me, that is the right direction. Diverse, we also diversified how to raise revenue in this budget. We only used two cents of the three cents authorized by its voters for the public safety tax in order to try to keep this affordable and spreading, again, diversifying how we raise the revenue. And to make up for that, we included a gross receipts tax increase of 2% uh, increase in the lodging gross receipts and a half, half percent <clears throat> excuse me, on meals, alcohol, and emissions under, under the gross receipts. That last piece will sunset after one year. This budget also includes important engagement principles that I will continue to use going forward as we continue to build future budgets. That includes proactively communicating with our unions and working in partnership to right-size our structure and create sustainable funding sources for those unionized positions within city government. This is much better than relying on one-time funds for ongoing work that creates, unfortunately, a cliff uh, in terms of the, of the budget, budget planning. There's fairness within this budget for our city employees. This budget, and I'm very proud of this fact, did not include any layoffs for fiscal year 25. And this was very important. We have structural challenges ahead of us in this budget and in this city, but our employees deserve a fair process. And I wanted to make sure that this administration works cooperatively with our unions and doesn't do anything haphazardly um, or with poor or abrupt processes. Finally, this process also includes, or this budget includes collaboration with our city councilors. I've worked with both the progressive and democratic caucuses to hear their input and incorporate many of their requests into this budget, all while making sure that this budget was balanced at the end of the day. And as such, I expect, fingers crossed, a unanimous vote tonight on this balanced budget. Finally, this budget would not be where it is today without the city staff who've put in hundreds, and I mean hundreds of hours of work to get us to this moment. I have asked every department head and many other staff who worked alongside them to help me do more than just balancing this budget, but to find additional resources to strategically invest in community safety. We also did more public presentations with the Board of Finance and City Council, more press, press conferences and more proactive communications with constituents than has been the past practice on budgets. And I recognize that takes extra work by all the city staff involved. So thank you very much. And many of you are in this room. 
And one final special thank you to CAO Shad, who has led the CT's office, the clerk treasurer's office, with grace and humility through an especially challenging budget year. And I've never bonded so quickly with someone before. So <laughs> I really thank Catherine because we spent hours getting me up to speed on this budget um, while then also adding to these added challenges. So I very much in gratitude to her. So we have some special guests today here at this press conference, so it's not just me. Um, and uh, first up, we're gonna have CAO Shad walk us through just briefly where this budget landed, and then we'll hear from Councilor President, Council President uh, Ben Travers, and then uh, City Councilor Gene Bergman as well. So first up, CAO Shad. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have stood before many of you talking about this budget. I am grateful this is almost the last time. Um, and every time I have referenced these budget principles. So I am again, not going to recite them all, but today I am here to present you the receipts on those principles. And so we will walk through them and I will let you know um, after a brief introduction, how the budget that is presented reflects each of these principles. Um, but first, as the mayor said, um, a quick overview of the general fund budget. If we go to the next slide, perfect. Um, you can see we landed at just over $107 million for our proposed budget. And as she mentioned, um, this is a growth rate of uh, just about 7%, and that is down. Um, our last budget was a growth rate of over 9%. So you can see we are certainly trending in the right direction. And on the next slide, you can see the effect of this budget growth on our municipal tax rate. You got the next slide, Jeff? Uh, thank you. Um, and that is about an eight cent increase or about a 10.7% increase. That includes the two cents that were approved by voters for the police and fire tax. And then it also includes increases that are um, automatic by either charter or ordinance. And that is specifically those four taxes at the bottom the largest of which is retirement and debt service. And those together are adding um, pretty much the rest of it. Uh, on the next slide, you can see the estimated impact of the increases. Um, and this is all of the increases, the estimate on the education tax, the municipal tax, and then all of um, the other utility fees. Um, as we discussed at the last city council meeting, the average price of a home over the last 12 months is close to that $500,000 level. It is just under. Um, so moving on to the principles, the first one, as you remember, is uh, we are committed to affordability for Burlington taxpayers. And you can see this in two things we've already mentioned. One is implementing just two cents of the three cents that was approved in the public safety tax. And the other is reducing that rate of growth of the general fund budget. The second principle was identifying sustainable financial practices that move us away from relying on one-time funds. Um, here, we point to the user fee study. Um, and as you um, have noted through the process of developing this budget, um, we have increased user fees, especially in the parks department, fire department and Burlington City Arts. So shout out to all of those department heads who are here, that is not easy work. Um, and uh, I really do wanna highlight this last statement here. We are definitely maintaining access for citizens who cannot afford those fees. That's an important component of the user fee study um, and ensuring that we do that equitably across the city and across those departments as well. The next principle is um, right-sizing the city's government. And um, one, a main way that we did that this year is almost a million dollars in savings 
from 18 vacancies that have been held open in this budget. The mayor has been clear we are not um, forever doing away with those positions. These are positions that happen to be vacant at the time. The affected departments have agreed to hold those positions open while we do a little more investigating to see when and if they should be replaced. Um, and we are still waiting for the operational efficiency study, but it should be received any day. And that is the tool that we will use to make sure that departments are appropriately sized and that work will continue over this next fiscal year. The next priority is being fair and raising revenues across the entire community. And so, as we mentioned, since we only implemented two of the three cents that was authorized for the public safety tax, um, one way that we're balancing that is the increase in gross receipts. So again, increasing the lodging portion of gross receipts from two to 4%, and then the non-lodging portion from 2 to 2.5%, that portion sunsets. And of course, the lodging portion, um, that really spreads the burden away from property tax uh, payers and towards visitors. We're assuming that most Burlington taxpayers are not also going to rent a motel room in Burlington. Um, and so we're really spreading the burden that way. And then, while many of us who are Burlingtonians um, probably do indulge in meals out, um, the non-lodging gross receipts is a consumption tax. So it's not something that you have to pay for like your lodging. And then the last principle is that the budget reflect the priorities of the city, including community safety, maintaining city services, creating a good process for city employees, unions, and the public to engage in these larger questions. And so we know some of that will be done um, continuing into this year because we haven't had the operational efficiency study yet, so we'll need to continue that public engagement. Um, but we are pleased to announce, as the mayor said, these um, very large investments in community safety and that we've had no layoffs and been able to retain critical city services. So in summary, um, we are already looking ahead to FY26. Some of you may remember um, in a Board of Finance meeting, former Councillor Busher said we could have one day off while we um, rested from this budget and prepared for the next one. So I'm gonna take that day. But we are looking to FY26. Um, and as I said, looking at the operational analysis, we're continuing to work with the user fee study to make sure that the new targets we hit are realistic. Um, we're actively investigating non-property tax sources of revenue. Um, and we started at our last Board of Finance meeting with reporting out monthly. Um, and we will continue to do that, especially um, making sure the Board of Finance is informed around gross receipts and user fees. Um, as two areas that really increase this year so we can make sure we're on track for FY25 and to see where that goes for FY26. And that's it from me. We will get to questions, don't worry. I know all you media love to ask questions. Um, and I, that's totally fine and welcome. But I just wanna send uh, do a quick introduction of our council president, Ben Travers, who I very much appreciate his uh, collaboration and the time we've spent really trying to dig into this budget to find a path towards compromise, which to me is when any level of government, but especially local government is working well, it's when we can find compromise and figure out, uh, really hear each other to understand why um, the requests are being made, but most importantly, get to that place of compromise. So Ben? Uh, thank you, Mayor. I really appreciate your inviting me and Council Bergman here today to represent the City Council. Uh, I'm going to start where you left off with your remarks, thanking department heads and city staff for doing a lot of hard work and putting this budget together, 
I want to thank you, CAO Shad, and your team for uh, all the work that you put into this, and, and Mayor as well. I suspect that there's a number of initiatives that you'd like to be focusing your time on, uh, but of course, in your not, not even three months, uh, first three months yet on the job here, uh, you've been having to focus uh, a ton of your efforts here on developing the FY25 budget, and I want to applaud you and your whole team for all the work um, that you put into this. Uh, Democrats and progressives here in Burlington are going to be aligned on many issues. We're also going to have our differences, uh, but we can never allow those differences to stand in the way of progress. Uh, working together and collaborating, as we've been doing with the mayor, is the Vermont way, it's the Burlington way, and we can't allow political differences to uh, result in, in gridlock. I think you see that here on a number of initiatives the council has taken on already this year. I think you see it as well in the budget. Since the mayor uh, first announced her budget, uh, council Democrats have been aligned with many of the in initiatives and priorities that she's put forward. Uh, we also saw opportunities for even further investments in public and community safety. And I'm thrilled that this budget includes uh, full funding for community service officers, which will uh, put additional public safety professionals in our downtown area and around the city. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled that it includes $350,000 in total uh, for our police department to improve their recruitment efforts to uh, get more police officers here as a part of our rebuilding plan. Uh, and I'm happy that this budget includes a housing administrator position as well, uh, which will uh, be another resource to um, enforce our minimum housing standards here in Burlington and to protect Burlington residents. Uh, all in all, Mayor, I think that this is a budget that, that I expect as well should have the uh, unanimous support of the council. Um, I'm appreciative of the fact that, yes, we can take a day off, but we will need to start looking towards FY26. I think intensify is the right word. Uh, as budgets increase, uh, percentage increases become larger. And I think uh, we're all on the same page that uh, an ever-increasing municipal budget along these lines is, is not sustainable. It's not sustainable for, uh, for the city or, or for the city's taxpayers. And so I do look forward to our putting in the hard work uh, over the course of the next year to find additional efficiencies and find additional savings as we look towards FY26. I'm also grateful that we were able to lessen the impact on taxpayers this year uh, by focusing on a gross receipts tax. Um, I, I, I will, am also mindful, though, uh, that a gross receipts tax does depend on a thriving business community. And so that is one of the reasons why many of us were so invested on, on ensuring there were additional investments towards public safety, as a thriving business community depends on uh, an improved state of public safety here in Burlington. And we will be watching that closely going forward. I also thank you, Mayor, for your commitment to over the coming year uh, transparency in the gross receipts tax. I know in the budget resolution it's built in uh, that there will be reporting monthly on how the gross receipts tax is doing. I know all of us on the council will be looking closely to compare the Burlington gross receipts tax to the local option tax from surrounding communities to make sure um, that Burlington's business community is remaining the most desirable, the most uh, vibrant place to do business and to visit here in Vermont. I appreciate you again, Mayor, uh, for your willingness to collaborate and for us to work together. I'm looking forward to tonight's council meeting. And again, I, I do anticipate that this budget should have the unanimous support of the council. Thank you. Should I, are you going to introduce Councillor Bergman or should I? OK, yes. You can do it better than me. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. I feel like we need a high five or something after that. That was all right. Now you're too tall. OK. All right, and next up we have uh, City Councilor Jean Bergman, who again, I appreciate, I wanted to make sure we had voices from both caucuses on our council, which include progressives and uh, Democrats. And of course, Jean has many years of service within this city, and I have found his service now as a city councilor such a, a really helpful moment of institutional knowledge and know-how uh, as a new mayor, and I really appreciate his wisdom he's also offered in this budgeting process. So, Councilor Bergman. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you, Ben, and to Catherine. Um, I've been at this for a really long time. This is my fifth term as a city councilor, starting in the mid-80s with Bernie. Served 20 years as an assistant city attorney, nine of them as a senior assistant city attorney. And I even spent 20 months as the interim code enforcement director and proposed two budgets for that department. And I have to say that balancing this budget without slashing the workforce and maintaining the essential things that we do as a city has been as challenging a job as I have ever seen going back to Bernie's first budget. 
Our new mayor, Emma Mulvaney Stanek, deserves credit for covering the gap. She did not do it alone. Many people are here in this room, but she deserves credit for closing a $14 million gap while maintaining services and employing alternatives to what our caucus believes is a regressive property tax, so our city's government can be as affordable as possible for the people having a hard time making ends meet. You know, affordability is a buzzword these days, but when what I see from the governor and conservatives and even many so-called moderates is the use of that term as a bludgeon to impose austerity. And it's a global phenomenon, not unique to Vermont, but austerity does not improve our lives or our health or even the ability of low and middle income people, working people, to pay their bills and get more financial stability in their lives. This budget does not do all we need to do, but it does enough and it starts the process for us to do better next year and beyond and I thank you for that. It uses more progressive source, uh, sources of income, the revenue, the gross receipts tax, a tax, by the way, that was first proposed by and adopted under Mayor Bernie Sanders. This allows us to set aside one third of the property tax increase authorized by voters in March to pay for new community safety work. It actually allows us to go beyond what the dedicated police and fire tax would have allowed us to do. And the services to improve the safety at the library are a prime example. I think your voices were heard and they're really important. For us, the mayor has already pointed out many other examples. The gross receipts tax, in our opinion, falls on people much better able to pay people with disposable income to spend at hotels and restaurants and entertainment. And the more that we can hold the line on property taxes, the less the pressure there is on rents for tenants suffering from outrageously high rents and on low and middle income homeowners who are still reeling from reappraisal and the shift from commercial to residential owners. Not to mention the huge percentage of property that is tax exempt in this city. I am also happy with the mayor's commitment to continue looking at alternatives to the property tax and property tax reform that focuses on the ability of people, of our people, to pay for the services that we need. Without this, we will continue to be running in circles with a wolf of austerity snapping at our heels. This budget rejects austerity. Yes. It holds 18 positions open, but I know our departments are doing amazing work on very lean budgets with far too, people, far too few people being asked to do a lot of essential work. And so I and we are therefore very happy that we'll be reviewing our budget early in this fiscal year, perhaps more than a day off, but so that we um, can get the work, that we can do the work we need to do going forward. So what is some of the work besides community safety that I think is essential in this budget? Because we've heard about community safety. Well, with a housing crisis, we desperately need housing that's affordable to low and middle income people. It's our workforce and is accessible to the most vulnerable, our, homeless, our houseless residents. And that is why the budgetary commitment to Champlain Housing Trust for its Cambrian Rise and the VFW housing, permanent housing projects is so important. With the climate crisis, we desperately need to make good on the commitments we made in the McNeil District Energy Resolution to reduce emissions attributable to the wood chip plant. If anybody in Vermont still questions the need just think about this last past week's heat wave and go today to the Winooski Bridge to see the waters rising in the Winooski River that in my belief as a gardener down in the Intervale who has gotten flooded out many times in the last couple of years, we will fl have floods again if we get another few downpours like we did on Thursday and so, or since Thursday. And we need to do all we can to build the workforce and support the businesses that do the work of building decarbonization. 
Our regulatory efforts at weatherization, for example, are being stymied by the shortage of businesses and workers to do the work. And this budget has that commitment. And this is why the budgetary commitments in both of these areas are so important and why the commitment to be really looking at sustainable and affordable budgetary ways we will advance these and other climate initiatives like, and I look at Charles here, the transportation demand management and the transportation options work that we need to do, and it's so important. It's important because our children and their children's children need us to do this work. And you know that we have to keep the lake clean and make the roads and sidewalks safe for all forms of travel and keep our parks safe and green and fun and have art and culture. That's for all and not just a privileged few. We created many, many years ago, Doreen, the arts program, and we are going to sustain that. And our waterfront must continue to be for the people. All of this requires a budget to support it, and this budget does this. But we know it's not perfect, and we have a lot of work to do. And so I look forward to the work in the next year to build a new budget foundation with the governmental structures and systems that are affordable and sustainable, and that have the funding based on values and long-term vision. My values and vision are progressive caucuses values and vision at their heart embody the words of Abraham Lincoln, who spoke them over 160 years ago, the values and vision of a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. I believe in this dream and can imagine us winning it by working together. We are showing that we are working together. I believe that we will get a unanimous uh, vote tonight. And therefore, let me just end with a thank you. And as I often will say, si se puede. What did I say about institutional knowledge, right? All right. So ever the overachiever, um, although I'm trying to do, do better at that, I want to talk a little bit about the next steps. So while we are about to deliver this budget uh, tonight to the city council, we're already looking forward into July and August with what this city will do next. Because one of the most important things that I've learned in these first three months is that there needs to be a better process. There needs to be better review within departments. There needs to be better collaboration across departments to really come up with a fair and equitable process for understanding what our city priorities are and what the city can afford. Um, so we've talked a lot about an operational efficiency study, um, and the study is due any day now. Um, but what we plan to do with this, this a very important study, which looked at several of our departments that are funded with general fund dollars, um, is to really make a fair and thoughtful process around using those recommendations. It is not a study I plan to implement in one year. I think that would be poor process. It is a study I plan to use to inform us in a probably multi-year process uh, with the help, the help of the CAO uh, to really look at where do we start first? Where are our priorities? Where can we have efficiencies? But most importantly, how do we create a fair process? Because there are working people involved in this budget. Every city government ever in the entire country are, are mostly, the expense is mostly human beings and working families. And I take that very seriously, which is why I want to have a very um, uh, fair process, open process, and one that really unions and staff and the public are fully engaged in. So we're going to get right to work on understanding that study when it comes in, in the next couple days. The user fee study is another uh, study that was done, which I also view as a multi-year tool. Uh, there are th some things when we dove into that with just even the three departments that did most of the fee increases within BCA and parks and um, fire, where we learned there were assumptions there that we couldn't, we could, uh, that were um, not, accurate and ones that we couldn't implement in one year based on what actually is happening here in Burlington, the state of Vermont. So again, a multi-year tool, but one where we also can look across the city and think about equitable fees across the city and how we implement them. And I think that's a great and strong moment for cross-department collaboration to make sure that those who cannot afford, those who have um, uh, seniors, for example, youth, uh, uh, have access to important city services that are not, uh, that they're not that they're able to still access regardless of what the fees may be because we have a consistent and equitable um, policy across the city. 
Um, we are also, I, I had fun names for this, but we are having an August financial summit, which is the most unfun name that I've come up with for this thing. But it's, it's a cross department uh, planning session that we're gonna start really diving into what are the practices that, that Burlington needs to create more long-term uh, long budgeting practices, multi-year budgeting practices, where we get out of this political cycle of, um, it feels a little bit like Hunger Games, of how do we balance and duct tape a budget together? We can do better. We have very brilliant people working for this city. And spreading out a planning process over a couple of years so we know when does this particular building or several buildings need support in our capital budget? What does, when do we need to buy a fire truck? When do we actually need to plan ahead for um, municipal tax increases so that the city can plan and residents can plan about the needs of our, of our city? And a big piece that you will continue to see is moving away from the use of one-time funds. That should be rare and occasional at best. And what we have, we've gotten into this habit of relying on one-time funds, bolstered by historic numbers of dollars coming from the federal government, of course. But what we really need to do is make sure that we're right-sizing and making sure we have diversified revenue sources where that one-time funds isn't a ongoing practice. And then finally, reporting. This is one where I think is where transparency shines. And we, as the CIO mentioned, we did our first monthly report just at the last Board of Finance uh, so that we all, including all, all of you and residents can really track easily where we are as a city. I want to make sure that this is an open, this is an open book kind of, of, of opportunity to understand how we're spending our money, how the money is coming in, what is, what is the forecast looking like. Um, my days as a legislator, I really benefited uh, from what we have forecasts because then you're making smart policy decisions because uh, you know in real time what money you have to use, maybe assumptions you made were not accurate. I want to make sure that we're continuing to continue to put this city on the right course uh, with transparency and good fiscal practices. I could keep talking, but I bet you have questions. So I will stop there and see what questions you might have. And also, thank you very much to my department heads who are here. I, I failed to say that formally in the beginning, but I really appreciate your solidarity truly throughout this very challenging um, task I was given. Uh, it was not on my bingo card, and my bingo, that is getting bigger for next year. It will continue to be on my bingo card, but that's okay, because I know all of you are, are here with me in that work. So thank you again for being here. All right, questions for me or others? Sure. Well, the first example is, is correct. We started with more vacancies we were planning to hold open. And that was after meeting with our 18 different department heads to say what were what was possible for, for the upcoming year, what could be held open. As um, it was mentioned before, either my remarks or the CAOs, I can't remember now. Um, it was a point in time moment. Um, it, was not a, it was not an equitable or fair process. It was a moment of you know April or so when I asked what happens to be coming open that we can hold open. And so uh, we did our first pass of what we thought could be um, positions held open. I asked each department head and, and three of the positions that I worked with the, the chief of police on identifying were three CSO positions. And that was based on a back and forth conversation where everyone was trying to do their part for, across the board as department heads. Um, to say, well, we, have, we haven't always filled these positions, we could hold them open, and, and then if we had the ability to stumble across more folks who would be interested in applying for a CSO position, we could make an adjustment. But my initial proposal uh, to council was to hold those three open for, again, fairness across all the departments. Working with my Democratic colleagues and that caucus, they wanted to fully um, support all 11 positions uh, so that putting those three back into the budget. And that's the example, again, of that compromise, that back and forth conversation. I think it shows also clear alignment on our common values here and our common goal of community safety. Everybody wants that. I don't think I've met a person who doesn't want that. Even people who don't live in Burlington want that for Burlington. So um, that, that felt like a very important compromise. And then my administration went and found some money to make sure that we could, could fund those positions because that was always the give and take in any budget is, okay, if you wanna put things back in, how are we gonna find the dollars to do so. Um, so we were able to do that with some, some additional finding of additional one-time funds because of the, the dollars were small enough. But as, the, as my colleagues and all counselors really recognize, this is not a budgeting practice we can sustain, which is why, again, the work ahead is so important. Um, another just quick example is the gross receipts. When I was sitting in my office for the first month thinking, how do we, how do we think about um, 
what revenue sources are, are available, it was easy to fall back on the three cents because it was already approved by, um, by uh, voters, of course. But then as my thinking evolved around the needs and hearing from the library around community safety needs, needs there, looking at charter language that governs the public safety tax, that, those, that revenue could only be used within those two departments. So I started to think creatively with my team and we realized, and, and counselors, uh, Jean Bergman, um, Councilor Bergman actually reminded me about gross receipts. It felt like an important way to diversify revenue, uh, making sure that we're not overtaxing residents uh, in terms of, again, affordability principles. I could talk all day about this budget. I am so ready to talk about something else. So yeah. Other questions? I bet you all can do presentations on this budget at this point, too, because <laughs> if, if there's anyone else other, other who's not on city payroll who's been here for most of it is these people from the media, I have to say. I can start cracking some mom jokes. Doreen, yes, hi. Okay. So it's maybe the first time that I saw it described this way. Can you talk about what the Vermont Cares part of the budget that 344 was that composed of? The BTV Cares? BTV Cares. Yes, the BTV Cares. Um, is it, was there a particular slide that was on that we can like pull back up? Yes, it is on slide the priority. And I could talk a little bit about the money side of it. And if you, if there's, if it's really a programmatic question, I can maybe bring the chief up to talk about it. If, it, if people have, yeah. so, so that the, uh, the BTV Cares again is a um, a crisis mental health response team that is going to be housed or has been housed in the Burlington Police Department. Um, this comes from a state grant. Uh, so the State Department of Health has provided these funds. It's about a two-year cycle grant. Chief, just keep me honest up here if I'm not like headed in the right direction. And so we have been work, slowly working to implement this. And so this will be, this represents um, fully funding that for the upcoming year. And then we will see where we are. I, I think all of us see an acute need for really bolstering mental health response, taking the pressure off of uh, police officers, supplementing what we do with our street outreach, for example. So this is a critical piece of the puzzle. And that's what that dollar amount, it's, it's actually a state. Um, there, is there a little bit of local match on that one? I can't remember. There yeah. is local match, yep. yes. But the, the, state money that we have not yet taken. We won this grant uh, in the previous fiscal year, uh, that, that, that is in this fiscal year, uh, and we have not yet utilized it uh, because we were in the process of staffing it. We have one employee for the team. The, the team's original design was to have three city employees and two contracted employees, and we are now working to, to change that a little bit. Um, but we do have one of those members on board, a uh, clinical care supervisor, who has been out doing work with our CSLs, working with uh, the, the CRT team um, in fire, and uh, we're eager to build on that by bringing aboard the clinician positions that will be underneath that clinical supervisor position. Thanks, Doreen. Do any other department heads have questions for other department heads? <laughs> <laughs> Not now, I'm just teasing, anytime, whoa. Uh oh, this is getting wobbly. That means we have to wrap it up soon. Sorry, yeah, our, our, our trusted little podium. Any other questions? All right, we'll all hang um, for a little bit if you have um, any questions for me uh, on the side. Otherwise, thank you very much for being here, and I look forward to a successful and maybe shorter council meeting tonight. We'll see. I know, I keep knocking on wood. All right, thanks all. I appreciate it. <laughs>